Mr. Chairman. Uh, my good friend, Pakistan's Anna Hazare, Ed Saz Essen Sahib. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, we have strategic partners, partnerships with everyone who doesn't matter, and none with the one country which really does matter for us in terms of a strategic partnership, and that is Pakistan. <coughs> the absence of a strategic partnership with Pakistan renders us extremely vulnerable. Our newspapers today have welcomed our Pakistani guests by informing them that we are incapable of defending ourselves against a Pakistani fly, let alone the Pakistani defense forces. But uh, the fact of the matter is that we need to go beyond considerations of whether we have, what is it, armor-piercing weapons or not, to see whether we could change the fundamentally restructure the relationship between the two countries. And I believe that there are very, very good reasons for us to understand this juncture as being quite exceptional in the history of the last 65 years. And that therefore, there is a moment to seize if we wish to seize it. Whether we wish to seize it or not is, of course, a decision that will require consensus within the country. But it is possible to stand alone on top of a stage and point to the reasons for which this is a juncture like none other that we have seen since 1947. I think first and foremost is a growing recognition in Pakistan, not just in the circles of the usual suspects, but across the board in the establishment of Pakistan as well as among the people of Pakistan, that barren confrontation with India far from resolving any of their issues, in fact, aggravates in many ways their internal problems. And I think we have to recognize here in India that our continuing confrontation with Pakistan is the single ser most serious threat to secularism, which is the bonding adhesive of our nationhood. I have been visiting Pakistan so frequently of late that I often find myself at the airport waiting to catch a plane to go to Lahore or Karachi. And the shifty look on the eyes of the Indian passengers, and if you attempt to engage them in conversation, the excuses they trot out as to why they're going to Pakistan, and the extenuating circumstance that they advance, that they'll be back in a week's time or in a month's time, and the assurance they attempt to give us that notwithstanding a family requirement to go to Pakistan, uh, please remember that I am a patriotic Indian, it just shows that there is a section of Indian society amounting to about 15 or 16 percent of our population which doesn't feel emotionally fully integrated with our country because of a salience that many Indians make between being a Muslim and being a Pakistani. Now, that problem doesn't really exist, even with regard to Bangladesh, although that is a Muslim-majority country. And, uh, and therefore, I see no reason why we cannot take our relationship to Pakistan to a point where it helps us. And nothing matters to us more than to preserve our nationhood. And to preserve that nationhood, we have to make all sections of Indian society feel that they belong. I think our record as a society in this regard has been amazing. There really is no deep-seated communalism in the Indian mind. And the proof of that was that the Babri Masjid destruction movement completely lost its potential the minute the first Gumbas came down and disappeared totally by the time the third Gumbas came down. And that is why the people who ran that movement have been going out of their way for the last 20 years or so, saying that it was the saddest day of their lives, that they never intended this to happen. Now, I don't know how you intend to destroy a masjid uh, by saying you're going to destroy it, but not really mean that you're going to do it. But it was the reaction within the Hindu community, to the, among the non-Muslim community, to this outrage, which I think definitively established for me 
the fact that Indians want to be secular. But we cannot become fully and totally secular until we have a normal relationship with Pakistan. And as for Pakistan, the Pakistan army has more than once conquered the one country it's totally capable of conquering, which is Pakistan itself. And it is this recognition that army rule in Pakistan is neither good for Pakistan nor even good for the army that has resulted in this astonishing situation evolving in the course particularly of 2012, but obviously its origins lie further behind in the past. And perhaps they will be traced by historians to Ehtizaz Essen having become a chauffeur and taken the chief justice all around Pakistan. That the army is an entity that can be taken on. And so we have a situation in, here in Pakistan at the moment where various challenges are thrown by the civil authority, particularly the political authority, and one that is among the weakest that has ever existed in Pakistan, challenges to the military establishment, which the military establishment is either deliberately not picking up or feels itself incapable of picking up. And therefore, we have a greater promise of democracy in Pakistan today than has perhaps been the case since 1947 or 1948. Now, in these circumstances, there is a desire to question, I'm talking about desire in Pakistan, to question the necessity of a confrontationist attitude towards India, which is, of course, the rationale for not only having an army to defend Pakistan, but also to have an army to rule Pakistan. Therefore, there is also, I think, attached to that the fact that communalism in Pakistan has undergone a remarkable transformation over the last 65 years. until. 1947, and probably well beyond that, the generation that obtained Pakistan had a visceral dislike of Hindus. It's impossible to be anti-Hindu in Pakistan today because there are so few Hindus to be anti. And much of their communalism in the mind has been converted into sectarian strife. And this sectarian strife is so <coughs> harming Pakistan itself that any intelligent Pakistani would want to get out of it. So to consolidate the nationhood of Pakistan on the one hand, and to consolidate the nationhood of India on the other, a dramatic alteration in the relationship between the two nations would help the consolidation of their respective nationhoods in their respective countries. For there is no doubt at all that it is Islam which is the foundation of Pakistan, which constitutes the basic rationale of Pakistan, and which is what, in a sense, unites Pakistan. But there is nothing so divisive as the Islamization of Pakistan. For the minute Islamization takes place, then you have to go back to texts that were written in the 7th century AD and later. And that causes doctrinal conflicts which are taken far more seriously within an Islamic society than they would in a composite society or in a non-Islamic society. This, I think, is the most fundamental reason why we should look upon this year of 2012 as one which augurs well for each of us and for both of us. The second is the question of terrorism. We have disrupted between 2008 and 2011 the ongoing dialogue with Pakistan owing to Mumbai 2611. And I think if there were any similar incident, it would be almost impossible for any democratically elected government in India to persist on the path or put it to one side. Nevertheless, the attempt by us to ask Pakistan to stand in the dock and confess that it is a terrorist state is one that was never going to work and has not worked. There has to be a cooperative attitude towards confronting terrorism. Now, that cooperative attitude back in November 19, 2008 was regarded as one that was impossible to undertake because the Pakistan state was sponsoring that terrorism. But between 2008 and 2011, it has become abundantly clear to almost all Pakistanis 
because it's a lived threat on a diurnal daily basis there that there are the th of the three types of terrorism based in Pakistan the terrorism that is based together, that is oriented towards the West the terrorism that is oriented towards India and the largest form of terrorism which is the terrorism directed towards Pakistan the state and its people are really indistinguishable one from the other in terms of the ideological sources from which they draw their strength as well as the weapons and the training uh, which goes into um, this kind of terrorist behavior and therefore there is a recognition which is self-evident when one visits Pakistan unfortunately very few Indians do or are allowed to go that this terrorism is a menace to ourselves so here we have a basis where we say that your terrorism is a menace to us they say our terrorism is a menace to us there on the other side so are there cooperative mechanisms that could be worked out to say that even if we are not able to find a cooperative answer to who is guilty for 2611 and how should they be punished and recognizing that uh, almost all of those who came to Bombay or Mumbai on the night of the 26th were killed the same night and there's only one person Ajmal Kasab who's still in jail and we are uh, the, the trial is going on to set up a cooperative relationship between the anti-terrorism organizations and there are several of the state both in India and Pakistan to cooperatively work to contain if not to completely eliminate a threat which in many forms is really common to both of us the attempt to use jihadis in Kashmir has been a patent failure the attempt to infiltrate people into Kashmir in 1965 and 1947 also didn't yield the results that were anticipated. There may be many problems in Kashmir, but very few there are asking that the solution lie in India handing over the state, the Riyasat of Jammu Kashmir to Pakistan. And there's a well understood reaction in Pakistan that yes, there are solutions to be found to what is regarded as the single biggest problem, but that those solutions cannot be obtained either by inflicting a thousand cuts on India or through military action. And it is in these circumstances that the dialogue between the two governments on the back channel in the period between at least 2004 and 2007, although its roots I think can be traced back to at least 1997, show that we can work around the problem to arrive at a solution which is mutually satisfactory. Or as happened over water that if there had not been a break in the dialogue in November 2008 I suspect that the manner in which the water issue was blown up in Pakistan in 2010 uh, wouldn't wouldn't quite have happened in the same way and we've seen from the conversations that have already taken place whether on the Tulbul navigation project or other matters that fortunately there is a mechanism available which intelligent people on both sides know exist and wish to use which could result in defusing the kind of passions that could be raised by the absence of water and I say this as a Tamilian for when Karnataka blocks the flow of water in the Kaveri there is huge tension in Tamil Nadu vis-a-vis -vis Karnataka so it's not surprising that a downstream state like Pakistan would have concerns about what is happening upstream but there is a mechanism and a forum which doesn't even exist between India and Karnataka between Tamil Nadu and Karnataka to resolve these kinds of issues and therefore we need to make our dialogue proof against terrorist attacks and it's in that sense that I've been urging this expression uninterrupted and uninterruptible dialogue now it does take two hands to clap but one hand at least has picked it up and the foreign minister of Pakistan is not only on Indian soil but repeatedly said that uh, she is in favor of an uninterrupted and uninterruptible dialogue so I asked the foreign minister I got a written reply I think two days ago in which uh, 
this was care carefully skirted around and uh, the standard reply that has been drafted by several of our foreign secretaries for the last uh, 30, 40 years was given to me on the answer. I didn't really expect it to be different. But what we need to work towards is a not so much a confrontational attitude towards this issue of terrorism as a cooperative attitude towards this issue of terrorism. I don't guarantee that that will work, but I do guarantee that the attempt to ask Pakistan to indict itself oh. is one that is bound to not work. And we may get some satisfaction from people referring to Pakistan as a rogue state, as a failed state, and so forth. But for them, these are words. For us, it's next door. And I think we ought to protect ourselves from terrorism. I'm not sure that we can protect ourselves simply by indicting our neighbor. And the third, what I call reciprocal reason, because it exists on that side and on our side, is that Pakistan is increasingly realizing what uh, it got itself trapped into in 1954, which is that it allowed itself for the last 60, 70 years to become a frontline state in somebody else's interest. And that is why the country that has helped them more than any other country in the world is the one that is most adored, uh, is most uh, de deplored. They don't like them for the help they have given them. And that is because no help is extended without something being taken in return. And what has been taken away from Pakistan is the totality of its sovereignty and the lives of its people and the lives of many innocent people. And therefore, there is a growing recognition in Pakistan that it is necessary to be a frontline state in your own interest. Even as India is backing away from what it used to be self-evident to me in my youth, that to be a frontline state in our own interest is better than being a frontline state in somebody else's interest. And what we need in India is some way of actually occupying on the international stage a role which we merit and which we will secure on, the, on all grounds of population, economic strength, etc., etc., but which will never come our way so long as there is a Pakistani albatross around our necks. It's not, you can, if you like, uh, de-hyphenate yourself from Pakistan and get some peculiar satisfaction from ensuring that AFPAC doesn't extend to AFPAC in. But in the minds of everybody else, you first resolve your issues with Pakistan and then come and talk to us is an attitude that we have to deal with in the world. So whether it is the consolidation of our respective nationhoods, whether it is a question of resolving the common problem of terrorism, or one of securing our place in the committee of nations in friendship rather than in hostility to each other. It seems to me that there is an orientation of the Indian mind required to move towards availing of this opportunity. And I just said a reorientation of the Indian mind because the change that is taking place in the Pakistan, the velocity of the change taking place in the Pakistan mindset is much higher than in India. And I suspect the reason for that is that Pakistan's own nationhood and the relationship of the state to the nation is much more tied up with their relationship with India than is the case in India. So the imperative of moving towards a better relationship with Pakistan is less in India than the imperative that there is in Pakistan to move towards a better relationship with us. And since we have desired a better relationship with Pakistan, since the depth of our visceral dislike of Pakistan has always been considerably less than has been historically true of the visceral dislike of India in Pakistan, now that that visceral dislike is undergoing a metamorphosis, I think we need to consciously step up what we are doing vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. Fortunately, the only Indian that really matters in foreign policy seems to be of this view. His name is Dr. Manmohan Singh. I'm glad that he has thrown out a hint in South Korea that uh, he may be ready to go to Pakistan. Indeed, had the visit to Pakistan been scheduled for February 2007 rather than March 2007, 
we might already have been way down the path of having put several of our problems behind us. But destiny didn't wish us to do it at that stage. But now I think we've come back to the point where what had been offered in March of 2007, a visit by the Prime Minister of India to Pakistan, can now take place. But unlike the Lahore bus trip, which was one of the most unorganized, disorganized political visits of importance that has ever happened, we need to prepare this properly. And the ground for it has been prepared through 15 years of the composite dialogue, which is now in phase two, they call it the resumed dialogue. Well, composite or resumed, there's been a lot of progress. Why don't we give a push to simply consolidating these results? Not by having a fractionated dialogue where water secretaries meet and home secretaries meet, but everyone gets together, put their minds together, and see how far we can reduce to paper what has been agreed. So that it becomes the basis on which a visit by Dr. Manmohan Singh to Islamabad can be not only declared the consolidation of the past effort, but that that constitutes the basis of the next phase, which has to be uninterrupted and uninterruptible to arrive at a solution to whatever outstanding problems there are. So in the hope that we can move forward, in the conviction that this is the right time to move forward, and with hope springing, as usual, eternal in my breast, I wish all of you all the very best in tackling the nitty gritty of these problems. And uh, I commend Seema for having tried to bring together elements that are in the establishment with elements that are in civil society. And let's hope that this mixture of track one and track two will help us get somewhere. Uh, I have to declare myself as an example of that mix, but I suspect I'm 90% civil society and only about 10% establishment. Thank you.